It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. The legendary voice of Sacramento Kings, PA announcer Scott Moak, firing me up before this Tuesday episode of the Locked On Kings podcast. Take a deep breath, Kings fans, because Rashawn Holmes is remaining a Sacramento King. Day one of free agency in the books. Three signings for your Sacramento Kings. Rashawn Holmes, Mo Harkless, and Alex Len returning to Sacramento. We'll talk about all three signings, and I'm going to be joined by ABC 10's Sean Cunningham. We'll talk about day one in free agency, go in depth about all three of these signings, the positives and the negatives for both. Talk about Rashawn Holmes's 55 or rather up to $55 million deal over four years with a player option. And we're going to have some fun today. Free agency day one, I thought was an excellent day for the Sacramento Kings. We'll go into it on today's episode of the Locked On Kings podcast. Hello and welcome to Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all regular season and all off season. If you're looking for in-depth analysis, game-by-game breakdowns, highlights, interviews with local and national experts, Full coverage of your Sacramento Kings from January through December. This is the place for you, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. And today's episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Visit rockauto.com and tell them Locked On sent you. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I've been a Sacramento sports radio host for the last six, nearly seven years. Actually, this is my seven-year anniversary this month, the month of August, and this will be season number eight for me covering the Kings, both as an on-air host and multimedia journalist. And how many times have I said over the last month to two months, really since the regular season ended, honestly, towards the end of the regular season, I said, Top of the priority list for this Sacramento Kings team this offseason is re-signing Rashawn Holmes, finding a way to bring him back. In my mind, Rashawn Holmes is the perfect center for this Sacramento Kings team. Of course, there are things that he could do better, things that the Kings are going to want more out of him now that they've made a more long-term, bigger financial commitment. Sean and I are going to talk about how he outplayed his last contract, but now that he has this contract, there's the weight of expectation that's put upon on him a little bit. Now, we're not going to look and have expectations on Rashawn's shoulders the same way we have expectations on De'Aaron Fox's shoulders or Buddy Heald's shoulders or even Tyrese Halliburton's shoulders, but still, Rashawn Holmes has to live up to this contract in a way, has to get better as a rim protector, maybe space the floor a little bit more, has to get better as a rebounder, and ultimately has to be more physical as this Kings team as a whole lacked a lot of physicality. But that being said, let's get the negatives out of the way because this is huge. This is huge for the Sacramento Kings. Now, I'm not going to say that Rashawn Holmes coming back means the Kings have a golden ticket to the NBA playoffs because in reality, the three moves that the Kings made in free agency today – for the most part, they're just bringing back the same or old versions of this Kings team. They haven't really made a drastic change or drastic upgrade, but still at the same time, When you're the Sacramento Kings and the struggles you have in free agency, hell, look back to last offseason when the Kings allowed Bogdan Bogdanovich to leave for Atlanta for nothing. When you're able to retain talent, especially when you're not paying absolute top dollar for that, It's a tremendous win. And I'm not just talking retaining talent in Rashawn Holmes. I'm also talking about Mo Harkless. Let's talk about these three. I'll give my quick opinions before we get to my conversation with Sean Cunningham. But I mean, you know how I feel about Rashawn Holmes. I think the prototypical center for this Kings team, the fact that the Kings were able to bring him back on a four-year up to $55 million deal, I believe is what Shams reported. Also as a player option on that fourth year reported. Uh, and I believe the up to $55 million is incentives or the contract is backloaded, meaning he'll be paid a little bit more in the back end of the c- contract per year than he is right now because that's all the Sacramento Kings can afford. When more details come out about that contract, I'll be sure to tweet about it at Matt George Radio on Twitter, uh, but also uh, I'll 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 talk about it here on a future Locked on Kings podcast. But regardless of what the deal is, Rashawn Holmes is still a Sacramento King. That's tremendous. That's a huge win. Uh, And he tweeted out how much he loves Sacramento, how happy he is to return. We know how much the the Holmes family is loved here in Sacramento. So the fact that we get that commitment, we don't have to be concerned about the starting center position here in Sacramento 
it's 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 a weight off our shoulders. It's a breath of fresh air, right? We can all kind of just relax uh, when we were really afraid that the Kings were going to go back to back seasons of of or back to back off seasons of losing a starter for absolutely nothing. Funny enough, they lose the one that they had uh, the restricted rights over, and they keep the one that was unrestricted, even though they had uh, his bird rights. So Rashawn Holmes still a Sacramento King, tremendous win there, but also just as big of a win. You're gonna hear Sean talk glowingly about this move. Being able to re-resign uh, Mo Harkless, the Kings bring back Mo Harkless for a deal around nine, nine and a half million dollars. I'm scrolling through uh, to try and get the exact number for you, but Mo Harkless was very, very good for the Sacramento Kings uh, when he was acquired at the trade deadline. The second half of the season, really, the only reason why that Kings team, who is drastically injured towards the end of the year, the only reason why they had a chance still at the playoffs. A lot of it was because of the play of Mo Harkless and DeLon Wright, but Mo Harkless was phenomenal, provides wing depth, which we know this Kings team desperately needs, uh, can score, can provide um, a presence on, on the wing defensively. So uh, the pickup for Rashawn Holmes uh, is a big win here. Mo Harkless is, I'm rather, I'm sorry, I said Rashawn Holmes, I meant Mo Harkless, who agreed to a two-year $9 million deal that wasn't them using that, that MLE, that mid-level exception that they had. Uh, so they just straight up brought him back and, and paid him for it, which is pretty awesome. And then the Kings went out and brought back a guy that I really liked in his very limited time with the Sacramento Kings when he was acquired at the trade deadline from the Blazers in the Kent Bazemore deal a couple of seasons ago. That is Alex Len. Now, I have to be careful not to get too excited because in reality, Alex Len is not a massive needle-moving signing for Sacramento. But the Kings lacked physicality. They lacked a presence in the paint offensively and defensively. Alex Len provides that. And remember, when Alex was here, uh, he provided solid uh, screen setting for De'Aaron Fox, giving him and Buddy Heald options and really whoever is, is dribbling the basketball. And, and we haven't seen someone set screens like Alex Len since. He's just a very solid fundamental player, a good rebounder as well. Uh, I like the idea of him being the backup for Rashawn Holmes, which leads us to this still pending Tristan Thompson for DeLon Wright trade that it sounds like it's still going to happen, but there's still a holdup, still some negotiations going on. I don't know what's going on with this deal, but if it still goes through, now you have Rashawn Holmes as your starting center. Tristan Thompson's certainly not a bad backup, but what does that mean for Alex Len? Now, the good news is we know what Len is on a, a, a small money deal, so it's not the end of the world if he's more of a bench filler and just some provides that big man depth. But at the same time, too, you have Namias Quinta, who you drafted. Uh, you have, who am I missing? Um, Damian Jones. There it is off the top of my head. Well done, Matt. Can't even remember who's on the Kings roster. Damian Jones also on this roster, even though he has a, a non-guaranteed contract. So suddenly the Kings have gone from no uh, real big man depth and concerns about who's going to play in the front court for the Sacramento Kings to now they've got this, this treasure trove of big men all of a sudden. Uh, and that was accomplished here during this uh, free agency period. So a very solid day one, very happy with the Kings moves. Now I'm not looking at this, these collections of moves and saying, Hey, the Sacramento Kings have made it. They're absolutely going to be in the playoffs, but I am willing to celebrate in a way what the Sacramento Kings were able to do in this day one of free agency. I applaud Monty McNair for the moves that he's made so far. I don't think the Kings are done at all. They could make other small moves. They still do have their mid-level exception. If I'm not mistaken, and on top of that, uh, we still know that the Kings are, are looking around and, and testing the market for both Buddy Heald uh, and Marvin Bagley. So deals still to be made. I think still a lot of offseason left. I'll talk about that and then some in my conversation with Sean Cunningham coming up next. Right now, though, I want to let you know that today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by Rock Auto. And with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts that you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and why wait for the person behind the counter to order the parts on their computer, but they choose only the parts that their warehouse happens to carry. doesn't matter what the price point is. That's what they're ordering. You have computers, you have access to rockauto.com. You can pick the parts you need for the cheapest price, just as easy as that. Look, I know nothing about cars, absolutely nothing about cars. And recently I found myself really cashing in on rockauto.com. I was driving down the freeway, a blown tire got blown, uh, blown into my lane. I couldn't uh, avoid it, rolled right over it. It uh, ruptured my fuel line and actually bent my radiator. And it would have been over $4,000 to fix 
But thankfully, I cut that price in half just by going to rockauto.com and ordering the parts that I needed. Really, all I had to pay for in addition to that was the labor. Saved me a ton of money. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck. Right, locked on in there. How did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. rockauto.com. Well, it wouldn't be free agency in Sacramento without a little bit of fear that the Kings could lose favorite players for nothing or without the elation of when a player decides to stay. Rashawn Holmes, we now know, will be a Sacramento King. His deal is for the next four years, still waiting for the specific specifics of his deal. We believe there is a player option uh, involved in that deal and worth upwards of $55 million. But Sean Cunningham from ABC 10 has sat through a lot of free agency periods, a lot of Kings off seasons, has seen a lot of talent come and go as early as Bogdan Bogdanovich walking last season. So Sean, welcome back to the Locked on Kings podcast, my friend. You understand how big of a win it is for the Kings when they're able to retain talent of Rashawn Holmes's caliber, keep them here in Sacramento for another contract. Yeah, we sure do. I mean, uh, first of all, Matt, good to be with you. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a good, it's a good uh, feeling for Kings fans to be wanted when, when somebody wants them, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's going to be fun to see just how this contract works out. You know, it is a four-year deal. We do know that there are some things within that contract we're a little unclear about. Uh, I'm not so sure that it goes up to 55 million. I think some of the options might be a little bit earlier than that. But if you're Rashawn Holmes and his agent, Pedro Power, you're thrilled for the fact that it's out there right now that it's a four-year deal, $55 million. I think some people might have been a little bit surprised by that. I know there's a lot of Mavericks fans that are surprised by it. A lot of Mavericks fans were hoping to see Rashawn Holmes uh, in Dallas. But uh, at the end of the day, yeah, you've got a pretty manageable contract for a starting center. And uh, I think it is a win for Monty McNair and his and his staff. Although I will say, um, you know, it's it's one of those buyer beware things. I think it's a, I think what we're going to learn is that there's going to be some provisions within the contract. There's going to be an option within the project uh, in the contract as well. So it's going to be uh, crucial for Rashawn Holmes not only to earn uh, something going forward, but also. Uh, the Kings have to get better to in, or, in, or, in order to be able to retain him for the full four, four years of this term. So uh, I think it is a good contract. A lot of people don't like to see how the sausage is made, but at the end of the day, yes, Rashawn Holmes will be a Sacramento King. And uh, that's at the end of the day, I think it's going to be make a lot of Kings fans happy. You and I have talked before about the, the mantra that if Rashawn Holmes is your starting center, you might not be a very good basketball team. Are we past that point with the second contract from Rashawn? You think of what he was able to do over the last couple of years, or will it take him being the starting center on the Kings being a playoff team to kind of shake that you think? That's a good question. I don't, I'm not totally there yet. Um, I think, look, now there's expectations. I think I think what made Rashawn so great is he was such a surprise for a lot of people. A lot of people didn't expect some of the numbers he was putting up, but we have to take the caveat, be objective here. This is a very bad basketball team. This is not a good team. And for him to stand out as one of the better players is what the narrative around the league is, which is if he's your starting center and he's putting up these kind of numbers, the likelihood of you being a playoff team, likelihood of you being a really good team, probably not that good. But that's just the starting point. Now you're two years in. Now you've got essentially possibly four years with Rashawn Holmes now. Now comes those expectations. Now it's time to bring those along and hopefully see those become better numbers with a more talented team, with more talent around you. Uh, so, you know, whether you, whether what was him being a good starting center with on a pos on a on a what we know is is a bad team compared to where they are now, who cares? Uh, we need to see that production and you need to see the team get better. Uh, it's it's very difficult to project not only what this team looks like when camp opens up in October, but even three years from now. So uh, I think it's a good starting piece. Obviously, Rashawn Holmes is a very nice player who has has made a nice role for himself in Sacramento. Now he's being rewarded rewarded for it. So. Uh, I, I'm very intrigued to see what the rest of uh, this offseason shakes out for this team. Yeah, now it becomes for Rashawn like a, a living up to your contract type thing, right? Which is pressure that is put on players sometimes they don't expect, especially when they earn that contract after outplaying or overachieving based off of the last one. So in your mind, 
Does Rashawn have to bare minimum continue the numbers and the success of the last two years as early as next season for this contract and then add maybe perimeter shooting or better shot blocking or just better all around defense on top of that to earn this contract? Or if he stays the same Rashawn Holmes as we know him to this point, if he stays consistent, doesn't really get too much better, doesn't get worse uh, for the, the, the existence of this four-year contract, is that good enough, I guess? Well, I think just steady the course, you know, I think everything he's provided has been a a positive. Now, can he do that with better talent around him? I think the one thing we know is he's going to play with his heart on his sleeve every single game. I mean, the guy is the heart and soul of the Kings. We say that both as a compliment and as a diss to the way the Kings are structured, because uh, what do we talk about? We talk about the Kings being a very soft team. So, uh, if they can follow that lead, and, and clearly they're adding pieces that that fit what Rashawn Holmes does, defensive-minded player, physical, um, get into you a little bit, alpha male. These are things that we've talked about for the last, really, several months about what this team really needs to pr- add to this team. So um, I do feel like Rashawn Holmes is a stay the course. I don't really care so much about the perimeter shooting. I would like to see him rebound a hell of a lot better mm-hmm. than he does. Um, that's probably the one area I would look at, but you know, by it, by and large, I think everything you've seen from Rashawn Holmes so far, as long as it it equates to wins and losses, just stay the course. So uh, it's just now that expectations are there, and now the guy gets paid a lot more than he used to. Um, sometimes that can put him in the in the crosshairs a little bit when it comes to the fan base. I don't want to take this in a negative direction with Rashawn because the re-signing him in my mind is worth celebrating. I thought Rashawn Holmes should have been at the top of the Kings priority list this offseason. The fact that they were able to bring him back and not massively overpay, in my opinion, uh, to bring him back, at least based off of the figures that we know right now, uh, I, I think is, uh, is, is a significant win. But I think with Marvin Bagley being here and Bagley's injuries that drowned out a little bit or kind of brushed the injuries that we've seen to Rashawn Holmes under the radar a little bit, missed a healthy chunk of uh, time a couple seasons ago. uh, And then last season also uh, missed some games here or there with some injuries. So is that something that concerns you at all? Or do you think, I mean, that's just going to happen periodically throughout any player's career and and injuries like that should prevent him from getting the payday uh, that he got. Are you talking about with, with Marvin? No, with Sorry, Rashawn. I, so Marvin, I, what I was saying, bringing Marvin in, is that because Marvin had these significant injuries that made him miss so much time, I think it brushed under the rug that Rashawn Holmes also missed some healthy chunks of time at times because of different injuries to him. I think he had like a, a foot injury, like a back injury or shoulder injury or something like that. And uh, we didn't talk about that much because so much focus has been on Marvin's injuries. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, look, I you know, it's a tough question to answer because, you know, Yes, you're right. You're pointing out injuries that Rashawn Holmes is much like Rashawn, much like Marvin Bagley has experienced, and and it really just comes at a toll for the way these guys play. I mean, both of them play supremely hard. Now, Rashawn's probably a little bit more physical, a little bit more tenacious. He's he's an NBA veteran. He knows how to use his body a lot better than Marvin, who just tends to be a little softer, uh, but obviously runs like a gazelle and plays hard. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really know how to answer the question. I think the I don't I don't put either one I don't put I don't put Marvin Bagley and Rashawn Holmes in the same category when it comes to injuries because really Rashawn Holmes has had the benefit of developing his game um, going through you know this is just happening to Marvin so quickly and some of these injuries can stunt your growth. So uh, whereas I see your point in terms of saying hey he's experienced a lot of injuries too and we don't make a big deal about it as much as we would with Bagley. And I think that's really the bigger part is just that Rashawn Holmes is a little bit longer in the tooth, a little bit farther along in his NBA career. So some of these injuries, even though they're not serious, like neither is Marvin. Like you know you don't have a knee injury, you don't have a at least a a you know, a tendon or a ligament injury. These are literally broken bones for, for Marvin. And they're, they're something that can heal very quickly. They're not something that's going to, to stick around. So um, while that is a positive, sometimes injuries can totally, you know, shape a a young and maybe warp a young player's uh, growth a little bit. So um, yeah, I, I think, I think I wouldn't be too concerned with the injuries that Rashawn Holmes has experienced during his time in Sacramento. 
Well, in addition to the Rashawn Holmes signing, I was thrilled with a couple other signings that the Kings made uh, on this free agency Monday. And one of my favorites coming back to Sacramento after a very brief stint in which he was very effective is Alex Len. And it sounds like Alex Len will be the primary backup center uh, for Rashawn Holmes. We saw him bring physicality while he doesn't necessarily fit offensively the up and down fast paced style that the Kings like to play at. Uh, he was very good in the pick and roll, set good hard screens, provided uh, provided a, a physical presence in the paint, rebounding a little bit of rim protection. I was very happy to see Alex Len return to Sacramento. I don't have too high of expectations for him, but I, I think an impactful player that the Kings were really missing. And we saw that lack of impact or we saw that hole was not able to be filled last season when he was gone. Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> I'm a little different on that one. I think I think you know they tried to fill it with Hassan Whiteside, who obviously impacts the game when he gets in there. He's a big, big body, rebounds everything, and the defense has to adjust. Uh, he does, and and it's not only defense, but you look at the way uh, when when teams are trying to penetrate the paint. Uh, when you don't have Hassan Whiteside in there, it's a completely different ball game to where he is. I think you get enough out of Alex Len to fortunately do that. Alex actually adds more on the offensive end, which will be desperately needed for the Kings. Uh, but I don't know how really how much to expect from him. I didn't, you know, I know he was a physical presence. To me, I think sometimes guys that that know how to play basketball and do things the right way really stick out on a team that don't. And I think that's what it became is people sent to look at the, what was it, 15 games, I believe, that he played in Sacramento. It wasn't really that much, but he was super impactful with the minutes that he had. So small sample size for sure. I think Alex, I'm not trying to diss Alex here. I think Alex is a hell of a player. Um, I think a lot of people get, you know, all they remember is, oh, it's former number one pick. How is he where he's at? But he serves a role. He's serviceable. Uh, and people forget he's only 28 years old. So this mm -hmm. is a this can be a, a, a nice little fit here for him. I think much like him and Tristan Thompson uh, with, the, with the Kings making this trade and, and likely him still being a part of this deal. Everything I've been told, by the way, with that with that three way swap with Atlanta and Boston is still going to happen. I haven't been told any differently that that won't happen. But um if Tristan Thompson is, is still in the Kings uniform by training camp, I think both of these guys can have really good impacts on this very soft Kings team. And we're looking at guys like Marvin Bagley who need to kind of play up to that, that's that stature and, and kind of, you know, get some of that tenaciousness that these guys have. So uh, I do like it. I'm, I'm with you. I, I, it is a little bit weird to see him gone and then back. I mean, he was waived from Toronto. I think he fit in pretty nicely with Washington. I don't know that he fits in all that well with this Kings team by October. I think there's a lot that kind of has to be shaken out there. Uh, but should he, I mean, if, if this deal is guaranteed, we'll have to see how the contract shakes out. But, um, yeah, it could be it could be a decent fit, and there, we certainly know what he can do and what he can't do as well. How you described Alex Len, you talked about him being a player that comes in, knows how to be impactful, does the right things, and that stands out on a bad basketball team. Do you look at Mo Harkless kind of the same way as Mo was the other free agency signing the Kings were able to to bring back to Sacramento? Mo was very effective in the second half of the season uh, after being acquired at the trade deadline last season. Is Mo kind of in that same category for you as Alex Len, or, or is he a little maybe higher than that? Yeah, I see the point you're trying to make, but he's immensely higher than that. I think Mo Harkless is the best uh, free agent signing that they made outside. I mean, they've only made three, but uh, Rashawn Holmes obviously is was the priority. But I, I think Mo Harkless is kind of right there. I think the only thing that's, you know, he's been well-traveled. We know that. We know what he was like in Portland. We know what he was like in Miami. We know what he's like in New York. I mean, the guy's been around for several different places. But the thing I like about Mo Harkless is he needed some stability, and we talked about it over the past couple months. I kept telling people, you know, I, I'd expect him to be back. I think he will be back. And now we see that, that yeah, he will be back. Not only does he add the veteran presence and uh, some some solid defense and shooting, he knows spacing, he knows the intangibles of the game, and there's no longer that huge expectation of him to be this budding player on a, on a team where you want him to be a second or third best player. That's far in the rear view. Now he comes in almost in a weird way, like almost in a weird way, like we'd almost want to see a, a Harrison Barnes. Um, now Harrison Barnes is on it uh, right now and one of the best players on the Kings team. We get it. Um, but Mo Harkless comes in without that expectation, but can obviously put up those type of numbers. Um, I always talk about 
a similarity between Harrison Barnes and Mo Harkless in the sense that Mo will take shots. Harrison doesn't oftentimes look for shots, but both of those guys also have a very innate ability to get to the free throw line, which is so, so desperately needed on this Kings team. So uh, I think Mo Harkless adds a lot of intangibles for Sacramento. And uh, I, I think people should be very, very, very excited that, he, that he's here. Today's episode of the Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by BetOnline.ag, the official sports gambling partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. You can bet on all the baseball action going on right now. You can bet on who's going to win the Super Bowl. Those odds just came out on Bet Online, NBA, NFL, NHL, UFC, golf, Olympics, they have it all. So before the next pitch or tip off or whatever sporting event you're watching, head over to Bet Online. Check out all their great bets, the lines that they have. You won't find better odds, and they have some really fun prop bets that I encourage you uh, to check out. Not to mention the future bets are a lot of fun as well. Head to their website or use your mobile device to sign up today. Use promo code Locked On when you first set uh, sign up, and you'll get a 50% welcome bonus. It's free money for you to gamble with. Also. Take advantage of our Locked On Bets show here on the Locked On Podcast Network, a free resource to help you make money on Bet Online, your online. You know, it's a bit of a balancing act with excitement here in Sacramento for this day one in free agency. Because on one hand, I, I look at retaining guys like Harkless and, and Rashawn Holmes and celebrating that, and rightfully so. We know how much talent has left Sacramento that they really couldn't pay or didn't want to necessarily compete for. On the other hand, you say, well, for the most part, It's the same team. The Kings have brought back, for the most part, the same players with the addition of Alex Len, who wasn't on the team last year, but has been a King recently. So I don't think anybody is looking at these moves and saying the Kings have done it. They've done enough to vault themselves absolutely into the playoff conversation. How do you handle that balance of, you know, this Kings team still needs to do more, more moves need to be made, especially potentially in in the trade market with Buddy Heald or Marvin Bagley, or maybe even Harrison Barnes. And then how much do you focus on celebrating the, the accomplishments of today? Well, you don't celebrate them. I mean, you'd be happy for that. You're seeing some guys you like, but they haven't won anything. (laughs) So, I mean, you know, I think smart fans look at it and they can go, oh man, I like this trade. I don't like this trade. Let's, let's wait and see. And I hate to be that guy, but it's really a let's wait and see. Look, we know that uh, you just basically brought back two guys that were on last year's team that was terrible. Um, But they were, they were standout um, performers on a team. It was clearly not them as a problem. Um, So you do want them to get better. But as I think people know is, if you're in Sacramento and you're a Kings fan, you know that free agency doesn't solve your problems as a Kings fan. It's done through the draft and through trades. And we've seen free agency so far. I think you might see a couple other little things shake out. Um, I think Terrence Davis is one of the things that that people want to see uh, as a restricted free agent. Perhaps there's a sign and trade possibility. Perhaps he's wearing a Kings uniform again. But I think you might almost need a trade before that. Um, I think we're going to wait and see what happens with this Tristan Thompson deal and how different it could look uh, with DeLon Wright going to Atlanta. So we've seen the draft. We've seen some free agents. We've seen a trade that should become official any day now. Um, and, and hopefully you're seeing some other trades because, yeah, you've added stuff through free agency, a lot of which you already know. You've added through um, the draft and – Obviously, people know Davion Mitchell and 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 how small he is in stature, but big he is in in def- defense and being a winner on a national level, national championship. Um, but these are you know these this this isn't a a team that you should celebrate and just put put in the playoffs yet. There's a lot of offseason left to go, and I think the majority of what this team changes will be done through trade. This is probably a pointless question based off of your let's wait and see, which you're you're absolutely right. But looking at the five additions that the Kings have made in the last week, assuming at the time of this recording, it's five. Maybe the Kings make more by the time you're listening to this podcast. But I mean, you, uh, da- uh, Davion Mitchell, you have Kata, uh, you have Len Harkless and Rashawn Holmes, which we've all talked about. We know how bad this team was uh, defensively last season. Based off of those five additions, are you ready to say you think this team will will be maybe not significantly better, but better on that end? Or is it like you just said, kind of a wait and see thing? Um, <laughs> Like, is it enough with how bad that defense was? No, it was really bad. You were the worst in the league, Matt. And so even if it's, even if it's better, like how much better are we talking about? Like, are you 25th? Well, you still suck. So <laughs> like, like, I mean, what difference does it make? Are you a top 10? No. Are you top 15? Probably not. So, Sure. Let's say it's improved to 28. Like we still don't know yet. Right. So yeah, I mean, 
I don't know if it's worth getting excited over. So, um, yeah, I, I, I would just, you know, I think, look, you've addressed the elephant in the room. You've at least tried to add pieces and build your team based off of glaring deficiencies. So, yeah, you, you would hope that because you've addressed some of those issues that you start to see maybe the fruits of your labor uh, that Monty McNair has put into this team. So, uh, yeah, I get that, but you don't know until they hit the court. And even though you think you may have addressed some problems, it, it, it may not have. And if it does, how, how much have you? So, um, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I think that's probably getting a little bit ahead of ourselves right there. We did an episode of King's Talk for ABC 10 in Sacramento, um, you, myself, and uh, Kevin, right before the draft. And we was right back about, there, by the way. <laughs> Hi, Kevin. Kevin in the background there. Yeah. Uh, and we, we discussed like names that we'd like to see the Kings target at the nine. And I don't, unless I'm misremembering, I don't recall any of us bringing up or really talking about Davion Mitchell. And that was the entire draft process really on Locked on Kings. Spent no time at all talking about Davion Mitchell because I didn't expect him really to be on the Kings radar. Not that I didn't expect him to be available at nine, but with the amount of wings at that range, I thought surely the Kings were going to end up with a wing on draft night. So that being said, we've heard Monty McNair's explanation taking best player available over fit. Your thoughts on the Davion Mitchell selection for the Sacramento Kings at nine. Yeah, I was one of them. I didn't think that uh, Davion Mitchell would have been uh, the pick at nine. Uh, I do. I've, I have had him in at least my top ten. I will say that. Um, but once James Booknight was there, I thought that would have been the pick. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I I felt pretty good about the Kings not necessarily going after um, uh, Moses Moody. Um, I felt pretty good about the Kings putting Josh Giddy ahead of Franz Wagner. Um, but once Wagner was off the board and Booknight was there for the taking, uh, and I think I might have been a little bit persuaded or charmed or seduced by Buddy Heald rumors because I had been, as we talked about, I had been hearing Buddy's name so much in the week leading up to the draft that um, when I was asked by Doug Christie, now soon to be King's assistant coach, shout out to him, but he, I keep joking that he put me in the interrogation room with the spotlight on my face, sweating with a gun to my head, <laughs> saying whether or not certain guys would be here. And he asked me about Buddy Heald. And because of all that chatter, I said no. And that was days before the draft. And um, so when book night was there and again, I, in my own top 10, he's certainly above Davion Mitchell. Uh, I really thought at that point, man, they're going to, they'll go after book night, but I really feel kind of knowing and talking to some people now, what I know that that clearly wasn't the case with Sacramento. They did go best player available. Um, I do think they had certain guys uh, higher that, that obviously jumped up. Like I mentioned, Giddy. I'm not so sure about Franz Wagner. I actually believe Mitchell was higher than, than Wagner. I'm, mm. I don't have that necessarily confirmed, but certain people I've talked to says, said, said as much. I mean, they've been on Davion Mitchell for years and, and in talking to a lot of people throughout the league and even on the college ranks, like it was almost funny that Davion Mitchell didn't know the Kings had been scouting him as as much as they were seeing AC Law, one of the King Scouts, in the in the Baylor gym quite often and him just not knowing that AC Law was there with Sacramento. So um yeah, I mean I know that got kind of made into a big thing, but uh, about whether or not he had worked out for Sacramento. It should never become a big thing. I always point out Steph Curry never worked out with the Warriors. Uh, and and we know Thomas Robinson never worked out with the Kings. So that's the the highs and the lows there. But um very low. Every everyone knew Davion Mitchell. We've seen him on a national stage, win a national title. Uh, Twenty two years old, tenacious defender. Um, everyone keeps calling him a dog. I, I love the fact that you know he's got that Chris Paul tie. Um, everyone. It seems like all these players when they're super small in stature, Isaiah Thomas, both Isaiah Thomases, by the way, Chris Paul. Um, you know. Earl Boykins. I mean, these guys are just Allen Iverson. They're just like little generals on the floor. So there is kind of an alpha male that comes with them. I think the leadership abilities that that he has are super impressive. And I mean, he absolutely torched Gonzaga. If you go back and watch that, I should say Gonzaga. I work with a coworker who says who says it's Gonzaga, not Gonzaga. I apologize. But yeah, I mean, if you go back and watch that national championship game, he took 
Corey Kispert, Jalen Suggs. I mean, he just took these guys completely out of the game. Uh, and uh, it was a team effort, that three-guard lineup. So we've seen that. I think Monty McNair even pointed out how effective that three-guard lineup was for Baylor. I think it's something that they want to you know, emulate here in Sacramento as well. So um, I see the positives. I didn't think they were going to go. I didn't think he'd be there. I, or, excuse me, I didn't think he'd be the pick at nine. But I think the thing I kept thinking more and more and more and we talked about it. I thought they were moving that pick. I didn't think they were going to be drafting the ninth pick anyway. So I felt um, that if they were picking nine, it wasn't going to be Davion. It was going to probably be a Giddy, uh, a Wagner, or or in Book Knight, especially if he was to fill, fall. I was really surprised it didn't go with James Book Knight. I had an interview or a conversation with one of um, Mitchell's assistant coaches at Baylor, and it's going to be available on tomorrow, the Wednesday edition of the Locked On Kings podcast, which speaks to a lot of what you just said about Davion Mitchell, his mentality, some great stories about uh, Mitchell's work ethic, and also some great insight on why Mitchell was able to make that jump from the low 30s and three-point shooting percentage to 44 45% in just one season. So keep an eye out for that interview. Uh, but Sean, I, I am a little skeptical about how high Davion Mitchell was on the Kings board, because like you said, you don't want to make too big of a deal out of a workout, but I feel like if the Kings valued Mitchell as highly as they did, they would have at least attempted to have him for a workout, which we don't know if they did or not. They said they had a conversation with him at the combine, or at least we learned that they had a conversation with him uh, at the, at the combine, but then also, and maybe I'm reading too much into the tea leaves here, but typically on draft night, you know, Woj, Shams, they have these picks. As soon as a team's on the clock, th these guys are tweeting out who they're taking. And the countdown clock went all the way to just over a minute before we got the uh, the announcement that Davion Mitchell was at the, the top of the Kings board. And I wonder if that was because the Kings were still last minute aggressively shopping number nine, uh, if they were deciding between Moody or Book Knight or Davion Mitchell. And of course, there's this, this rumor or this theory more amongst uh, NBA executives that this was more of a Vivek Ranadive pick, which I think is more based off of reputation than anything else. Regardless, I, I thought it was interesting. Again, maybe I'm reading too much into the tea leaves here, but yeah, I, I, would... I wonder how much of the, the, the plan was Davion Mitchell all along and how much of it was, hey, last minute kind of scrambling uh, with the spot they ended up with, with Wagner maybe being taken at eight, and then Davion Mitchell was there, which maybe they didn't even expect Davion to fall to nine. Yeah, I mean, I... I... Look, I, I think that they strictly went best player available. I mean, you're going after a point guard when you've got Deeron Fox and you just drafted Tyrese Halliburton the year before. I mean, that to me shows they went best player available. Um, I do believe they shopped the pick. I, I do believe they shopped it. I mean, I shouldn't say I do believe. I know they shopped the pick. Um, whether or not they know what they were getting for it um, could have impacted things. And I think, think if you think of it this way, um, had the deal – and I don't like to report this as fact, by the way, because – you know, it gets out there that that there was possibly a deal for the Lakers. I think too many people look at that and what was reported and say, oh, that was going to happen all of a sudden before Russell Westbrook was magically available. No, it doesn't work like that. There, there's, there's discussions, there's talks. But if that is the framework of the deal, I kind of feel like what, if you're the Kings and you were getting the Lakers 22 and maybe one of those pieces you're getting from the Lakers and you package it with, say, the 9 and the 22, maybe you would progress talks further along that way. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you liked op you know some options that were available with those pieces in mind. But when that trade didn't happen, again, not to say that that was going to happen because the way I look at it is I think you were, you know, the Lakers were, were shopping. They, again, I know for a fact, the Lakers took Kuzma, Montrez Harrell, KCP, uh, Contavious Caldwell Pope, for those who don't know. And, um, and, and really with the, with the hope to get KCP off of the roster, because that was a very tough contract. When you look at the way the Lakers are, are structured with some of the pieces that they were hoping to, uh, not only add today, but in the future. And obviously you've got Dennis Schroeder, who's a restricted free agent, and he's likely set it headed for another team as well. So with all that in mind, Sacramento's deal didn't have Contavious Caldwell Pope as part of the deal, at least on paper, what was reported. So um, I'm fully behind the fact that the Kings didn't want to add KCP and they didn't get very far. They said, okay, we at least know this framework of this deal with Sacramento. Um, we know what's over here with Russell Westbrook. But this also gets rid of Contavious Caldwell Pope, and I think that's why a lot of the trade gets made and what, where you ended up. I don't think that it was, you know, unfortunately some people jumped the gun. I don't think it was as close as 
being you know, nearing an agreement or anything like that. I think they had a framework of a deal from at least what I had been told and, and understanding what that is. The reason I say that is, is because I feel like once that deal didn't happen, you knew what you could get with that nine. And once book night fell to you to where all of a sudden, maybe you weren't expecting book night to be there. Maybe you were, but if you weren't, Hey, book night's available. Now I've got the ninth pick. Let me shop that because your conversations of shopping the ninth pick might look a lot different before you know you've got book night for the taking. Um, so I think once you have that or anybody who might have been interested in Davion Mitchell, um, you, you kind of shop it around and you see it. Um, again, I think one of the things we like about Monty McNair and things I've learned, and I've told you this, Matt, on the show, which is he loves out the word optionality. He loves to be involved in everything just to try to be able to you know, see what could be possible, see if you can make your team better. And it's going to put, I think, Kings fans and some media through the ringer because I think a lot of media are learning some hard lessons. And, and this is why you don't, man, you just got to be careful. You don't want to be wrong. You, I mean, everyone wants to be first, but you don't want to be wrong. So people remember that. And uh, hopefully some of these people will too. Well, speaking of Monty McNair, I, I actually really liked how he answered one of the questions that he was asked. Um, and I think it was Jake, Jason Anderson from the Sacramento Bee that asked the question after the draft. Jason asked, like, how do you view rotation wise, minutes wise, getting Don, uh, Davion Mitchell on the floor and getting him playing time when you have a backcourt of Fox and Halliburton and Buddy Heald, who still happens to be here. He hasn't gone anywhere yet. So you have minutes for him to figure out as well. Now, this, of course, was before uh, the DeLon Wright theoretical trade that still hasn't been finalized yet. But McNair, the way he answered the question, I, I really liked. He said, our best players are going to play, which to me, essentially reading into it was him saying, Davion Mitchell, we're going to find a spot in, the, uh, in minutes in the rotation for Davion Mitchell. And then well, we... No. No, it was more like, hey, Jason Anderson, I don't coach the freaking team. <laughs> That'll be up to the coach. I mean, again, again, best player, he's right. Best players will play. And certain guys play better with certain others. And and you have to remember, Davion Mitchell may be a rookie, but he's not a rookie. He's not necessarily a rookie. He's 22 years old. I mean, this guy's going to come in with – it's going to be a little bit of a learning experience. But, again, he's so small that – he, he, you know, he's got to learn how to play in this big, this grown man's league. So uh, I, I have all the confidence in the world he'll be able to play. I just don't know what it looks like yet. But yeah. we also don't know what this team looks like yet either. And that's right there. The I don't know what it looks like yet is where I'm a little skeptical because we've heard conversations about or just theories about the possibility of this three guard set. Maybe not a starting lineup with Fox, Halliburton, and Mitchell on the floor together, but certainly stretches. Maybe if you need more defense uh, and are trying to match a, a small lineup or trying to go small yourself with that three guard set out there. And I like the idea of it. It's one of those I have to see that it'll work to believe it type things. But I was curious your opinion on the possibility of the three of those guys working together. Together. I'm fine with it. I mean, we saw three guard lineups last year. I think I don't think it's going away. I like I like that Luke Walton likes the three guard lineup. I think it works better with someone like Terrence Davis, who has a little bit more size to him. Um, you know, Buddy works great with it too as well. So um, I, the other thing I'd point out for people who are just trying to push Buddy out of town or can't wait to get Buddy out of town, look at some of these deals of shooters, the the Duncan Robinsons of the world, mm -hmm. Doug McDermott. Um, I'm forgetting another one. Uh, but just big role players that are just getting 80, 90 million dollars uh, in this free agency period in day one. So it kind of makes that Buddy Heald contract look not as bad, in my opinion. So, um, yeah, you mentioned it a minute ago, don't forget about Buddy Heald. Please don't forget about Buddy Heald because there's a very good, strong possibility he's still on this team as this elite shooter that he is. And the best part about it is you're starting to add some playmaking around him. So um, the only playmakers they had last year uh, when they added – uh, Delon Wright, he ended up being the third playmaker. So I know people want to see, oh, was he going to start? Is he not going to start? You know, I think this kind of makes you appreciate what you have in Buddy Heald a little bit more. I would hope so, at least if you watch basketball. Um, but yeah, obviously the basketball IQ of this team needed to get a lot better too. So um, Buddy ended up standing out as a big sore spot in this team last year. So I think it could be, uh, I think it could be fun. I mean, again, we're talking day one free agency. There's so much offseason left. Mm -hmm. It's almost, you can keep yourself up at night trying to <laughs> trying to figure some of these things out. And I just think you're racking your brain for no good reason. Uh, it's good to kind of look ahead to training camp and see what might exist. But 
boy, there's so much, there's so much off season left. Anything can happen. Well, speaking and, of that, and from that, and from that point, you hope so because they're still not a good team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of that too, uh, and we'll wrap up with this, Sean. Uh, the, I mean, outside of Sacramento, free agency day one, we we heard going in right is like, oh, well, we don't have as much cap space, or teams don't have as much money to spend, and I feel like we every time we hear that, that gets blown out of the water within the first hour of free agency because you start seeing these ninety million, hundred million dollar contracts being thrown out, eighty million, fifty million to guys that you're like. Really? That guy? Uh, it's, it happens every single offseason. So I wanted to get your thoughts on some of the other deals from around the league. Any that really jumped out to me, you? I mean, we could talk about, wasn't really a free agency deal, but more of a contract extension for the Atlanta Hawks and Trey Young, who gets a five-year, $207 million deal, which is just absolutely crazy. But are, any other moves around day one of free agency outside of Sacramento that, that jumped out to you or stuck out to you that you think are, are bad or good or exciting or interesting? I mean, I think I think an extension for Jimmy Butler is I, – I really like what Miami did. I mean, I think Kyle Lowry going over there is going to be just absolutely great. That puts them back in the conversation. Um, I think it's going to be great for Lowry, a guy who uh, – it'll be fun to see him get through kind of the uh, the weight test over in Miami, the famed conditioning test. But um, he, he's someone who always carries himself a little bit bigger. So uh, I do want to see that. I think Utah made a pretty good splash in keeping Mike Conley. It was a very um, team-friendly deal, I felt. Uh, I think it was necessary. I still like to see them add another wing to that team. I think they're going to add something there. But, yeah, you know, I, I the Spencer Dinwiddie thing to Washington, I think we all kind of assumed that was going to happen. I actually like that move a lot for the Wizards. Um, you know, the I, 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 I'm not so sure I – I mean, I think Kent Bazemore is going to be a really good addition for the uh, for the Lakers. This is just spitballing off the top of my head, just some of the additions they made. I think Dwight Howard obviously comes in and addresses a need. Um, and Chicago with with Lonzo Ball, I kind of like what Chicago is doing over there. I think there's some some pretty intriguing uh, pieces there. I think if you're a New Orleans Pelicans fan, you're a little concerned. But I do like Devontae Graham, um, but I do feel uh, David Griffin is rightfully so probably – getting dragged over the coals a little bit, but we'll wait. There's still a lot of off season left. So, you know, I don't know that today was a monumental day for the Kings. I think it was a good day. Um, I think there's still a lot of things that, that need to happen. Uh, I think we, right before we started doing this, we saw the deal for Otto Porter going to the Warriors. You know, that just makes sense for a team that, that is, uh, getting Clay Thompson back, that's going to be their biggest offseason acquisition. Yeah, he turned down, I guess, the mid-level exception at a, a couple of places to take a minimum deal to go and play for Golden State. So, I mean, it's a gamble on his part financially, but also a, go, a chance to play in, in a bigger spotlight for a, a team that's looking to get back into the, the championship picture. So we see gambles and plays like this all the time in free agency. You brought up the Chicago Bulls, too. Also have to talk about the acquisition of Alex Caruso. We might want to check on uh, Jason Jones at the Athletics, see if he's handling that, because Caruso is his guy. So uh, just another nice move by the Chicago Bulls, I thought. Oh, I thought so too. And yeah, I know I have a ton of Laker friends. Jason is among them. And uh, yeah, they're not well. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think they understand. I mean, look, they understand. They've got, when you've got guys you like on your team, but you have LeBron James and Anthony Davis, you know, hey, you're going to keep tailing, uh, tailing Horton Tucker. I mean, that would, I think, make things a lot better. Mm-hmm. Um you know, we'll see what Schroeder commands. It seems like the market is a little bit lighter than what he was expecting. He thought he was getting a deal for a hundred million or more. Might still happen. Still, have plenty of plenty of free agency left. And shoot, while we've been doing this 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 podcast, maybe he's agreed to a deal somewhere. I doubt it, but um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of intangibles there. Trevor Ariza going back to the Lakers is weird. They, they seem to have gotten older. Um, you know, I, I don't know, but I do like the Baysmore pickup. I think it's he's really kind of one of those players exactly like what they need. And if if Dwight Howard's right, and I thought Dwight Howard was really right this past year, and really for the most part the year before that in the bubble, um, this could be a this could be a good signing for for LA. Well, whatever happens in Kings free agency, we know you'll be all over it. You'll be all over the California Classic and the Golden One Center this week, all over Summer League, all everything. Uh, Sean Cunningham from ABC10 is always on top of it. I look forward to having you back on again on Locked on Kings in the near future, recording more Kings talk with you in the near future as well. Uh, and pretty soon, regardless of the moves that are made, we'll be getting to uh, to training camp and really discussing the meat and potatoes of what this team is going to look like uh, for the start of next season, where hopefully the playoff drought will come to an end. But Sean, thank you for uh, your time as always. I appreciate you and I look forward to doing it again soon. 
Appreciate it, Matt. Yeah, I look forward to it. And yeah, the closer we get to training camp, once we get all this transaction offseason stuff in the rear view, I can't wait to actually start prognost prognosticating and trying to figure out and forecasting what all these these situations, these these rotations and minutes and you know what it's all kind of looks like. That's Luke Walton's problem. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about that right now. I'll give you a sneak preview. It's Matt George overreacting to it and Sean Cunningham <laughs> reeling him back into a little bit dose of reality. That's why I love it so much. Sean, thank you. Huge thank you to Sean Cunningham for joining me on today's Locked on Kings podcast. And like I talked about in that interview, tomorrow's Locked on Kings is going to be must listen. As I sat down for an interview with Bill Peterson, he is the special assistant to Baylor men's basketball head coach Scott Drew. Baylor men's basketball where Davion Mitchell comes from uh, and, and coach Peterson told me a ton about Davion Mitchell's work ethic his journey to the NBA told a ton of great stories about his time at Baylor and gives us some inside information about how Davion Mitchell made that massive leap from low 30s and three-point shooting percentage to 44 45 plus percent. You're going to want to listen. It'll make you fall in love with Davion Mitchell. If you haven't already, the stories that Bill tells are just incredible. So please check that out tomorrow. And again, thank you to Sean Cunningham for joining me on today's podcast. If you want to res uh, respond to anything that we talked about, please do so at Matt George Radio on Twitter. Email me mgeorgesacklocalmedia.com. Or if you're watching on YouTube, comment below your thoughts on our conversation, the moves that you like, maybe moves that you don't like in free agency, other targets that you'd like to see the Kings go out and get. Write those down below. I'd love to to engage in conversation with you there. Also, I have to sneak this in really quick as we got news today that Doug Christie, of course, Sacramento Kings legend, will be joining Luke Walton's coaching staff. And Doug Christie is someone I've had the pleasure of working with for the last four years or so um, at Sports 1140 KHDK Radio in Sacramento. And I just want to say this, Doug is such an incredible person. The way he acts, the way he portrays himself on, on television or when you see that kind of quirky smile and that loud, ho, oh, hey, ho, oh, ho, oh, that is who Doug Christie is. It is 100% authentic. He is just a happy, joyful man. I'm so grateful for the time that I've gotten to spend working with him. I'm going to miss my conversations with him about golf or trash talking or whatever uh, we're talking about. But I know that Doug has had dreams of being an NBA coach and getting onto an NBA bench. So him getting this opportunity with the Sacramento Kings is tremendous. I think he definitely will help with the player development on this team. He will definitely help defensively with this team. So congratulations to you, Doug Christie. I hope to have him on the Locked on Kings podcast in the near future to talk about this move. Um, but regardless, just an incredible man. Couldn't be happier for him. Uh, and I, I hope you understand what he brings to the Sacramento Kings, what he means to this city. Uh, and I can tell you, he commits wholeheartedly to be the best at whatever he does, whether it's playing, coaching, uh, talking on the radio, doing commercial reads. He commits 100%. I have no doubt in my mind that he's going to be a very successful NBA coach. So congratulations to Doug, uh, big friend here of the Locked on Kings podcast, and of course, friend and a hero of mine in many ways. Grew up watching Doug play uh, in the glory days here in Sacramento. I know many of you did as well. So congratulations to Doug. Thank you for watch, uh, watching today's episode or listening to today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast. I look forward to having you join me for tomorrow. Again, Bill Peterson, Baylor uh, assistant basketball coach, former coach of Davion Mitchell will join me tomorrow. You're going to want to hear the stories and the things that he has to say about the new Kings rookie. So join me for that. And until next time, my name is Matt George. You have been listening to Locked on Kings, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.